Hello and welcome to the Global Church Project. I'm Graham Hill. Steve Chong is the founding leader and director of the Rice Movement. He loves seeing God raise up the next generation of young people. Steve is passionate about seeing Australian Asian youth be used by God. Having worked as a youth pastor, he completed Bible college and then spent seven years leading a church. Now he leads the Rice Movement as an itinerant preacher. He lives by faith and speaks at different churches and conferences around Australia and abroad. His vision is to see a generation of Asian Australians raised up in discipleship and mission and in the service of Jesus Christ. Steve Chong, welcome to the Global Church Project. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. You're an itinerant evangelist and the founding director of the Rice Movement. Yeah. Can you tell us something about the Rice Movement and why it was started? Absolutely, yeah. So I was involved in founding it uh, 15 years ago, actually. Yeah. And what it was was just a bunch of young people getting together. So it was actually a bunch of youth leaders. And we got up together and it, was, it wasn't rocket science. We just sort of said, look, we share a few things in common, apart from the fact that we all love Jesus. We said, you know, well, we love um, running youth ministry. And we all happen to be this interesting DNA of Australian, but born Chinese. Right? So we've got, uh, we're, we're Aussie and Chinese at the same time. And so we're all leading youth groups. We thought, let's just get together. And we had one heartbeat, one, one main aim. And the main thing that was beating in my heart was for evangelism. And so we thought, what would happen if we got together, pulled our resources and said, let's put on one evangelistic event and see how that goes. As we put that on and it was just, um, we were, we were, we had no idea what God had in store for us, but yeah. I've been watching some of the videos and the events look amazing. So yeah. can you tell us something about the events and yeah, who sure. goes and what happens? Yeah, sure. And, you know, the videos that you perhaps have seen um, about the rice movement have been kind of recent ones. But really the first event was only like a, about 100 kids and we held a bush dance, which is a weird thing for Asians to do. <laughs> 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 but we, we, it was just so much fun. And we just ran it, man. A bunch of Asians looking at bush dance. Who would have thought of that? It's crazy. <laughs> and so we did that and then um, actually it's just been doubling and all the way yeah. through and just growing and nuts. And, and, and really Recently, um, we've been in kind of, you know, big auditoriums with a few thousand young people. And the most exciting thing for us is that we, we, we really believe in the rice movement. I really believe that the gospel is powerful to save. So I, like, I, I know that just rolls off our lips, but I, I really believe it. Like, I, I just believe that if we proclaim the news of Jesus, uh, that that is in itself attractive and God will draw people to himself. And so we've been doing that. We've been seeing hundreds and hundreds of young people um, come to know Jesus, recommit their lives every year, um, and it's just been a real thrill. So these events, we get together, we have a big a kind of a, a key, the key focus point is that talk, that gospel proclamation. Of course, we have songs and um, creative elements like um, dance and choir and all, sort, all those kind of things. They haven't asked me to be in the dance team yet, very much. I don't know why. I keep waiting. <laughs> How do you think the Australian-born mm. Chinese community, both mm. the churches and the young people, are reshaping the landscape of Australian Christianity today? I, that's a really good question. I, mm. I really believe that, um, of course, evangelism is our key, our main, main thing, but, but really an outflow of this has been the, the, un, the unity that's happened amongst a whole generation of Australian-born Chinese who I believe are uniquely placed um, uh, to be in this country uh, where they have such a significant role to play in the leadership of the church and, and in communities, actually, in society. Uh, I, I guess one, one interesting thing to say is I'm, I'm borrowing a little bit from uh, John Anderson, who's the ex-Deputy Prime Minister of Australia, and he's been watching the rice movement, a very big supporter of it. And he told me the other day that what, we, what we're seeing, of course, in the world is... Um, uh, and is is the, the rise of the East. The, he, he said he calls it the fall of the West and the rise of the East. That's what's going mm -hmm. on. And he said, what we're looking for, what we really need is in the church is a generation of young people who are of the West but not in the West. Um, and I remember trying to hit, listening to him and thinking, oh, I can't even keep up with you. This guy's too smart to understand. What do you mean? Of the he, he said, come on, Steve. What major country, he said, is of the West but not in the West? And I thought... I said, Australia, of course, right? There's all our heritage is from the West, but we're not in the West. He said, yes, right, everything we do is pegged to Asia. And so what we're looking for is a whole bunch of leaders that, that are kind of chameleon enough to, to jump across both those DNAs. And I think um, what we see that, we see that in Australian born Chinese, people who are of the West, but not in the West. And they've got a key role to play then, I think, for the future of this country uh, and um, even perhaps back in towards Asia. 
Yeah. Mm. So your leadership is diversified a bit. So I don't think you're only Australian-born Chinese as a movement anymore. Yeah, no, is that right? Yeah, that's so right. What's I happened? Mean, yeah, sure. So, I mean, um, it, it, it started mostly with Australian-born mm. Chinese. And, of course, we've got all sorts of other um, flavours of Asians involved um, now. And so we, we have um, Koreans coming along, Indonesians, Vietnamese, uh, etc. And so we just, it's really, um, it's, there's a lot of shared DNA. Um, you know, we sure we all love Jesus and that's, that's similar, but we've got the same work ethic. Um, you know, Asians, when we get together, we, we do things fast and quick and en masse. That's just what we, <laughs> that's how we roll. We've got some good things about our culture. Like, you know, we, we respect our elders. That's a good thing and been biblical too. Um, and we've got some hard things too that aren't so good, like we're just a bit obsessed with study and education mm. and career. Yeah. But what it means is that there's a subculture there that, that we can really speak into um, and something that I think God's really brought together. What do you think are some of the key things mm. that Australian-born Chinese and uh, Asian Australians are saying to the church in Australia today? Yeah. I think, um, think Australian-born Chinese are are seeing the church and they're seeing that that um, they do have a lot to offer, a lot to bring into mm. um, the current church space. That is, um, some of the things that um, you'll see if in, in Australia, in Sydney at least, or, mm. and Melbourne, most of the capital cities, is because of the influx of uh, in immigration, um, uh, what we're seeing is we're seeing so many of our schools, our top schools, um, uh, they're just full of Asians. I went to a school named James Roos and mm. that's in Sydney and it's pretty much entirely Asian, right? And, and that's because education is the highest value for commodity, you know, for all, all, all these young people. But what I think they're seeing is that at, what the Australian born Chinese I think are saying to the church is they've been given all these opportunities here and all this ability to, you know, go to some of the top schools and take out great positions in universities and the doctor degrees and lawyer degrees. But I really think that um, a lot of them have incredible amounts of gifts that are untapped um, in our churches and a really big voice towards multiculturalism, I, I think, in our, in our society, in our church. So, yeah. Sometimes I see some of our churches seem to be afraid of diversity mm. or a bit of afraid of multiculturalism. Mm. How do you think the Australian church can begin to embrace its diversity today? Absolutely. I, I, that's a really good question. I, I think that the Australian church um, needs to be just trying to say it in a bit more polite way, but I'm not sure how to. Like, mm-hmm. I think all I, I think the only way I can say it is that they need to open their eyes and see what what our country looks like now. Yeah. And and and, and the truth mm. is, I I look like this country at the moment. Like, yeah, I, exactly. I, if, yeah. if you look at me, I mean, if, if you're podcasting, you can't. But if you if you're listening online, you'll you'll know that I, I you'll, you'll say I, I look highly Chinese. But I, if you're hearing me, you sound like I sound like I'm, you, you listen to an Aussie. And, and that's what the new face of Australia really does look like. You know, I don't speak any Chinese, um, but I, 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 I do feel Chinese um, as well as Australian. And I, and I think that um, I think that the church needs to not see that as a, a big, uh, they need to shift from thinking, oh, we've got to bridge this gap to these people who are living in Australia, but actually move to this is what Australia looks like now. Yeah. And, um, and, and, that, and our churches should reflect that. Mm. So I notice a lot of the kind of traditional Anglo-type churches yeah. are, are wrestling with what it means to become more diverse mm. and to look like their culture and their yeah. neighbourhoods yeah. more. Do you think that that is also something that the uh, some of the diaspora churches or whatever term you want to use, the, the Asian churches need to wrestle with as well? Yeah, I think so too. I, I think equally, um, while the Anglo churches are wrestling, how do we you know, look more multicultural. The, the, I think the Asian churches also need to be thinking through, um, you know, what does it look like? It's a hard question. What does it look like for, for them to be, um, I can say this because I'm Asian, not become little um, Asian ghettos, um, little places where we kind of just hide away together in our shared DNA, but really also see what that, what, what, what that looks like for us to do that as Australians in Australia, I think is a really significant thing for churches to think through. Um, uh, and I think it's quite a wrestle because, I mean, Theologically, for me, that's a, that's a big deal because um, uh, I think Asian churches, um, they're fine, they're great, they're, they're, they, they work because of the shared DNA, but really we're all on the way to the great gathering in the new creation, mm. which is all tribes, all tongues, uh, uh, everyone around mm. the throne of Jesus. So that's the ultimate aim. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And it's a very complex thing, I suppose, because all of us love to worship and, yep. and in our 
uh, heart language. Yes. Um, and for many of us, you know, it's, it's trying to work out what, what does it mean to be able to do that, but also to embrace the diversity of the people of God yeah. at the same time. Yeah, no, yeah. for sure. What, what's your vision for the Australian-born Chinese youth? My heart for the Australian-born Chinese youth is mm -hmm. that the opportunities that God has given them, the gifts mm -hmm. that God has put um, in them, a lot of them have just, um, I just think, incredible intelligence, drive, mm -hmm. passion. My, my, my dream is that that all gets captured and used for the glory of God. I, mm -hmm. I, I would hate it if they ended up becoming a, the, the, you know, the Australian-born Chinese Christians youth end up just making a whole lot of money. Not they can if they want, as long as they give it to the church, other things as well. But I and the poor, <laughs> but I, and, but I, I just hope that they have a that, that they really see that that these opportunities aren't things that are just given to them by their parents, but actually given to them by Jesus, by God, and um and therefore. Um, to use that well for him. That's my hope. That's my mm. dream. Yeah. And recently you went to the Middle East with Open Doors as well. Yeah, actually, yeah. Well, what was that all about and what did God do in your spirit during that trip? Yeah, that's an incredible, incredible time for us. It's really been a game changer. Mm. Um, one of the things was uh, Open Doors offered uh, Naomi and I a trip to open our eyes to see what it looks like to live by faith. Um, Naomi and I uh, at the time were uh, still are, I guess, living by faith, kind of in terms of our income, just whatever God brings in. And um, we went, and the Open Doors guy said, look, we want you to see what it would be like for people who really live by faith every day have to actually live their life or death matter. So we actually went, um, uh, they took us over to Iraq. And um, that was a big deal. Naomi and I've got four little kids. And so we've got four kids under the age of um, nine years old. And so saying goodbye to them, riding their wheels, being told that we can't be sure that we're coming back alive because we're going to a place that was 10 kilometres away from ISIS's mm. headquarters. And so it was a full-on time. At one point, we, you know, we crossed over the war zone and we, and we, and we you know, heard three bombs go off in 10 minutes. It was a full-on time. Mm. But the thing for me that absolutely revolutionised all of that for me, that, that revolutionised my whole life, really, was I went there expecting to see a struggling church that was um, scared and hiding in a room. But instead, I, I found a church that was bold, alive, growing, united, and absolutely on fire to Jesus. In a way, to be totally frank, that put us to shame in many ways. Mm. And I, I just, you know, I, I've never seen anything like it. You know, to, to go there and, and ask guys, look, how can we pray for you? And to watch this guy's, the, um, this, this house church leader, um, look at me with puzzlement and say, Oh, thank you that you want to pray for us. That's very kind of you. But we've actually been praying for you in the West. Mm. And we said, I said, why? So we, we're worried that you guys are beginning, getting sleepy and complacent. Mm. And, and, and we've been actually praying for persecution to come to you guys so you can be more mm. alive and awake. Mm. And I just all that kind of stuff just messes mm. with your head. And so mm. it's, um, it's really uh, caused my faith to rise up. Yeah. What do you think are the key things that um, Iraqi Christians yeah. can teach the church, church in the West today? Oh, there's so much. I mean, I, yeah. you know, I, this podcast will go too long otherwise. But <laughs> I just, I, look, in the, at, at least I, they can teach us that, um, that, uh, that when, when persecution comes, um, I think in many ways their faith, our faith gets refined. And we shouldn't be surprised by that. that Jesus talked about that. Um, the, the expectation of persecution to come for his followers. And in fact, the early church was just birthed out of the context of persecution. And, um, and so for me, I think we, we kind of have uh, forgotten that um, it, in, it is in the context of persecution that, that our faith gets refined and, be, and our boldness and ability to, to, to understand what our purpose is uh, on earth and the proclamation of our faith really should, uh, goes up. And so for me, I feel like the Iraqi Christians have so much to speak to us about. Um, for example, one Iraqi man uh, said just incredibly, I um, uh, can't reveal his name, of course, because that um, really he'd be in a lot of danger if they found out what he said. But um, he, he said that for him, he said before ISIS came, he was a Sunday Christian. By that he means I'd go to work during the week and just go to church on Sunday, go to work and go to church on Sunday. He said after ISIS came, he said, my faith became alive. And he said, so for me, ISIS is a gift. And I just think, how, do, how, do, how does that work? How do you even think that? Because for him, his ultimate aim is 
uh, is living for Jesus. And to hear mm. him, uh, I'm sorry, I've got so much to say, but I, I oh, just think... a powerful story. I, yeah, it's just incredible. Mm. And I, I just think to see, in terms of what these Iraqi Christians, that man, that same man said, he said, Christians in the West are too afraid to die because they're more in love with life than Jesus. And I just think how someone who lives in the shadow of ISIS to be able to say that, and mm. for me to think about it and know it's true, um, and to say that um, the church is becoming sleepy in the West. So I think we've got a lot to, to, to learn. We, we, we tend in the West to have this kind of, sadly, this kind of superior kind of, and I did when I went over there, this kind of um, how can we help kind of thing, you know. Mm. But, but really, um, there's a lot to learn the other way. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, I just spent some time in a conversation with a lady who has spent much of her life in uh, India and parts of Africa. Yep. And she was saying to me that this is one of the things that irritates her, actually, is yep. that she sees a lot of um, Westerners come to Asia and Africa with this kind of superior yeah. posture. Yeah. Um, mm. And then sometimes the spirit humbles them, but sometimes they, they continue yeah. to act as though yeah. um, they've got lots to give but nothing to receive. Yeah, it's a real problem. And I think I think the Western church, I mean, if I can make such a big call, like, yeah. I think the Western church, I mean, <laughs> not that I know much at all, but I, 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 at least for myself, I feel like we need to, um, to take a humble position and mm. to realise that, um, uh, that in many ways there's so much more so much to learn from the from the Africans, from the South Americans, and definitely from the China ch- church in China and, and Korea mm-hmm. and other places. That's where the um, that's where the action is going to be at in the next turn of Christian history. Yeah. What do you love most about your ministry? Whew. At my core, I'm an evangelist. Right. Like I, I just so at the very if I strip it all, all back, mm-hmm. for me nothing beats seeing people, in my case, young people, but anyone, um, come to know Jesus. So in fact, as an itinerant evangelist, I'm speaking to mixed Mm -hmm. um, ages all the time. I I just can't, um, nothing fires me up more than seeing someone move from death to life for eternity. Like the stakes are very high. And when someone comes to know Jesus, for me, um, that is, that is, um, that is the best there is. And um, Mm. uh, I can't get enough of that. Mm. Close behind. Is, um, is, is, is the mobilization of people using their full gifts and passions for, for the glory of God. I, I think so much of that is untapped and uh, latent in people. And I think as they start capturing what it is, that, who it is that God made them to be and use that for, for God's glory, then I think and when I see someone write, you know, work out, hey, you know what, I, I didn't realize but I've got gifts in that. And I am really passionate about that. I think um, seeing them on a lifetime of service for Jesus is awesome. Mm. What's most misunderstood about some of the things that you say? Do you ever hear somebody, so, you know, you're passionate about a particular issue and then you hear somebody sort of uh, comment on your ministry or the things you're saying, you think, actually, that isn't really what I'm getting at? Wow, what a question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, of course, anytime anyone's yeah. in leadership, you attract all sorts of um, criticism and, mm. and, and, and people uh, unfortunately misunderstand where things are at. And I mean, the first thing I do, when, I mean, when I hear criticism, I, I do listen to it and make sure mm. that I that there aren't things that in my heart I need to tweak. But I do think that, um, that uh, people, I think, do at times misunderstand, um, say, for example, our desire for evangelism, um, my desire for evangelism, and that's coming through the rice movement. I think some people feel like, you know, why do you need to do an event to do that? Um, why do you need to, um, you know, bring people together with, you know, people on stage and some lights and sound and other things like that. And I, I, I do find that hard sometimes because I think um, I think that's a false dichotomy to put these two things um, against each other. And I just think um, reaching young people, um, I think there's a lot of um, a lot of power in um, a young person for the first time who's kind of a quiet Christian hiding in their school to come together and go, wow, there's a few thousand of us out here. And mm. um, so those mm. kind of things I think are, are hard for me um, to think through. Um yeah, mobilising of people. Um, I think it, sometimes in my desire to see, say, young people become all that God has for them, um, uh, as anyone out there watching knows, that when you it, it's, uh, when you uh, do stuff with your gifts and your passions, that takes time and energy and sometimes it's quite exhausting in a good way. Mm. Uh, but other people look at that and go, oh, like you're pushing people too hard, we're going too, 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 too fast. So those are the kind of things. That, there's always a flip side of that. And, and I think I know that most of the strengths that um, I or the, or the movement, rice movement brings, um, the flip sides of those strengths are our weaknesses as well. Mm. So. Steve Chong, thank you for joining us at the Global Church Project. It's been a real pleasure to be yeah. here. 
The Global Church Project is located at www.theglobalchurchproject.com. On our website, you'll find a wide range of interviews and resources for colleges, universities and churches. I look forward to your company next time. From me, goodbye.